between psychopathic traits and negative emotion, and that kids who have a genetic predisposition to psychopathy and who experience a lot of negative emotion are at heightened risk for developing uh, psychopathic traits. And, the, and the, what makes them at this heightened risk is that they cope with the negative emotion by developing these two, these two things. Negative, we call them negative perception and chronic anger expression. I'll say just a little bit about each of these. Negative perception is a fancy term. It's not my term. It was actually coined by David Licken to describe the ability that some people have to reduce the impact of, of stressors, of basically noxious stimulation. Um, in, in the old days, um, it was okay to give people electric shock. Actually, electric shock's making a comeback now in psychology studies, right? But in the old days, people didn't worry about it. And so they would see numbers count down to zero, and then people would get a shock when it hit zero. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> okay? Right? You get a shock. And what they find is that a lot of people get really anxious in anticipation of this shock, but some people don't seem to get as anxious. And what, they, what Licking found in one of his studies was in people who were lower in anxiety, they showed a big heart rate increase before the shock came. And then they didn't have much of a heart rate increase after the shock. Bob Hare, testing prison inmates, found that people who had psychopathic traits tended to show big heart rate increases before the shock, um, but did not show big increases in skin conductance, that is, uh, uh, you know, sweating in the, in the hand. Um, uh, they didn't show this elect electrical conductivity. And Bob Hare argued what's going on here is this, and it seems like David Licken's saying something similar, it's a mechanism for attenuating the impact of a stressor. It's a kind of a coping response. Here's Bob Hare's version. The heart rate increase is a, is a sign of the act of coping, and then the lack of electrodermal activity, lack of skin conductance, is a way of showing that the coping worked. They were able to reduce the impact of the noxious stimulus. Okay? So what we have argued, Stephanie Penny and I, is just that this same idea applies not just to outside stressors, but to internal negative emotions. That some people learn to attenuate the impact of negative emotions such as sadness and fear. Now, we don't know that we're right, but, but it seemed like right, it, would, it fits with this literature, with the countdown paradigm, and we wanted to see if it would work with emotional stimuli. Um, I'm actually not going to present any of my data on negative perception, but I just felt if I'm going to present the affect dysregulation theory, I should give you the two pieces of it. I will talk about my data on anger expression. I have to give you a little background. Poor anger control is widely acknowledged as, as a feature of psychopathy. It's one of the items on the psychopathy checklist. It's actually called poor anger control in the PCL youth version. In the PCLR, it's called poor behavioral control. But it's measuring the same idea, that in response to frustration, there's kind of excessive display of anger compared to what you'd expect. Um, people frequently act out. They, they show more anger even than they intended. Um, but people don't... Uh, so. And, and this is on other measures of psychopathy, too. Self-report measures, parent ratings of psychopathy have this poor anger control item in there. So it's accepted, but it doesn't really fit that well with an emotional deficit, right? If you have an incapacity for negative emotion, how could you have excessive anger responses? It doesn't really make sense to me. There are, there are ways people try to fit it in, but I'm going to skip over those again in the interest of time. Um, our argument is that what happens is that youth who are basically, again, learning to tune out some negative emotions don't try to tune out their anger because anger often gets them what they want, right? The, uh, I don't know if you have this expression here. In, in America, they say the squeaky wheel gets the grease. If you throw a fit, right, sometimes people will give in just because it is so unpleasant listening to you throw a fit. Right? And for you students, I encourage you to practice this with your instructors. Okay. Um, 
There is also some very interesting evidence that people who are very high in testosterone seem to get more of the rewarding effects of anger expression than people who are low in testosterone. And some of you may know there is at least a little bit of evidence linking testosterone levels to psychopathic traits as well. So our argument is that these kids with psychopathic traits, or who later develop psychopathic traits, get pretty good at tuning out a lot of their negative emotions, but not their anger. They concentrate on the anger. They skew things towards the anger. And this development of chronic anger expression contributes not only to the poor anger control we measure as one of our items in our psychopathy assessment, but to a lot of the core features of psychopathy. Um, I, again, want to skip over this because I'm worried about the time. All I'll say about this is that we also have argued that environment can be important, um, that in, right, with um, very helpful environments um, there, you, that uh, can increase the extent to which kids learn more adaptive ways of dealing with negative emotion, um, and that um, exposure to violence and abuse um, and rejection uh, uh, may well enhance the uh, uh, going down this maladaptive route, but I'll, I'll say more if people want to later. So. Um, we, we started looking at this in youth. These are my initial data, not yet published. Um, I'm just going to talk about the anger expression and the negative affectivity. We have the psychopathy checklist youth version for psychopathy, for anger expression. We have the anger out scale from Spielberger's anger expression measure. And we have measures of ch childhood depression and anxiety as well. So the first thing, we just wanted to replicate whether we would see this positive correlation between psychopathic traits and negative affectivity, and you can see it here in our sample, significant relationships. But then we wanted to see if there's something happening developmentally, does the age of the participant matter? So we looked at this two ways. We looked at it continuously and we looked at it dichotomously, just uh, did a, a median split of the sample based on age, and we looked at the young versus the old. And when we did it continuously, we found nothing. We found no interaction between psychopathy and age. But when we did it dichotomously, we found a big, a significant uh, interaction. So here's the results for younger, actually I'll give you both, younger adolescents and older adolescents. I see that the value for the younger adolescents changed. That makes me nervous. So I'm, clearly I've got the wrong value in for one of these. I think, <laughs> I think, I think this is the correct one. Um, and if you want, I can check later. But anyway, what you can see is in our younger adolescents, just with a median split on age, it was around 15 and a half was the cutoff, we have significant correlations between psychopathic traits and depression and anxiety. In our older adolescents, we don't see it. This is more like what we see in adults. So it makes sense, right? Things are changing during adolescence. Now, what about anger expression in particular? Well... We, we figured we'd look at both anger out, the tendency to chronically express any anger someone's feeling, and anger in, the tendency to chronically inhibit the expression of anger. When we looked, in our, and I'm skipping ahead of the overall analysis just to give you the younger and the older. Actually, in the younger adolescents, we saw relationships with both anger out and anger in, interestingly. Um, but... Uh, uh, the anger in is not statistically significant, but it's, you know, it's approaching. When you look at the older adolescents, really there's just anger out is there. Anger in is not. Now, one of the other big problems with looking at anger expression is that anger expression correlates with the experience of negative mood, right? All of those kinds of negative emotion tend to go together, so we wanted to run some analyses in which we controlled for negative affect before we looked at this. And these are the partial correlations. I, had, I didn't bring with me the partial correlations for anger inhibition, but I can tell you none of them are significant. But here they are for anger out. And you can see that after controlling for Taylor manifest anxiety scores, the correlation in younger adolescents is no longer statistically significant. There still seems to be a little something there, but not nearly as strong as in the older adolescents. It appears that this anger expression mechanism is developing during adolescence, getting stronger, apart from its overlap with anxiety. And finally, getting back to crime, I looked only at violence, 
and I'll just show you the regressions. And again, I just didn't bring with me all the numbers, so I'm sorry. That's why there seem to be some numbers missing. Uh, the only thing I've got are the uh, um, proportion of the variance accounted for by psychopathy. If you enter, and in all of these, we entered anxiety first to make sure that we weren't dealing with any overlapping variance. If you look at psychopathy entered initially, it's accounting for about 7% of the variance. Um, this is for my whole sample of adolescents. If you look after entering anger expression, psychopathy only accounts for 4% of the variance. So it looks like the anger expression matters. I did run these analyses also separately for the younger and the older, but I don't think I put it on the slide. Oh, I, did, I, did, I just put the older one on the slide. In the younger, it didn't come out. It didn't come out at all. But in the, in the older, it dropped from 4% of the variance to basically 1% of the variance. And I ran these same analyses using the bootstrapping analyses, which are a more sophisticated way to test for indirect effects. And uh, they, they came out as well. So um, that's as far as I got on my slides. Um, but to sum up, what I would say is we now have pretty good evidence that psychopathy and antisocial personality disorder can be distinguished not only in terms of criminal conduct, but in terms of underlying mechanisms. We still need to replicate in more samples, of course. And then, in addition, we have some exciting new data, which we'll see if they hold up to peer review, but seem to suggest um, that some of these mechanisms we've identified in psychopathy may help to explain the relationship between psychopathy and crime. I'll stop there.